Good afternoon, and welcome to, the, to today's talk on preventing childhood injuries uh, and recognizing signs of abuse hosted by Tallahassee Memorial Healthcare. We thank you all for joining us, and uh, this is our final baby and family fair webinar, and we look forward to talking with everyone about how to keep your kids safe today. Um, clearly, I am not Lauren Book. Um, I am Senator Loran Osley, and I will be your moderator today. Um, Senator Book had an unexpected uh, family issue come up and she asked me to pinch hit for her. Um, obviously, you all know her long history with these issues um, and I'm, I'm honored to be able to, to fill it in her stead. Um, I'm joined today by four experts that are experienced in keeping our kids safe and caring for them when things go wrong. Um, Dr. Tom Truman is a pediatric critical care doctor at TMH's uh, pediatric intensive care unit, and I have per firsthand knowledge because my kiddo was there 19 years ago. Um, M Monica Tucker is a nurse manager for children's services at TMH and Safe Sleep Ambassador. And Chris Lolly is the executive director of Prevent Child Abuse Florida. We are hoping to be joined by Dr. Ryan Price in a, um, later in the, in the webinar, who's a pediatric orthopedic surgeon at TMH and TOC. Um, thanks everybody for being here. Our discussion today is going to include a wide range of topics related to early childhood injuries, including sports injuries, water safety, safe sleep, child abuse, neglect, and many other things. Um, before we get started, I just wanted some housekeeping. If any participants have questions, please submit them through the Q&A feature in Zoom, and we'll be monitoring those as they come in and hopefully answering them in real time. So let's get started. Um, we'll talk about some trends for Dr. Truman to start us off. I'm curious to hear uh, what you've been seeing in the PICU. Uh, have there been any, any pediatric injuries you've seen more than others? Uh, well, it's been a busy spring, uh, I have to say. We've seen quite a variety, uh, multiple motor vehicle crash injuries, uh, skateboard. Uh, we've seen some snake bites. Uh, we've seen a few near drowns. Um, and just a, a wide variety of injuries. We've, unfortunately, we've even seen a few gunshot wounds. And so it's been quite a, quite a variety so far this spring. So um, for, for Dr. Truman and Chris, we're, you know, we're gonna be talking about a, a, a tough subject, child abuse and neglect. Um, over the course of the pandemic, um, have you seen any trends associated with abuse and neglect? Uh, in the pediatric ICU and the pediatric floor at Tallahassee Memorial, we, we certainly saw an uptick in the number of uh, child abuse cases and child neglect uh, with, during the pandemic, uh, as well as uh, mental health issues uh, such as depression and suicide uh, attempts. But uh, overall, we, we saw what the national trend was, and that was an increase in the amount of uh, child abuse, uh, both in forms of neglect as well as physical abuse that wound them up in the hospital. And Chris, you know, let's kind of stay on this topic because it's important and I know everyone here is passionate about this. Abuse and neglect are more common than people think. Um, so can we start with the definitions? What constitutes child abuse and neglect? Yeah, well, first I have to say what a privilege it is for me to be here in such a steam company. It's good to be with all of you today. Uh, and my heart aches when I hear uh, things like what Dr. Truman just said. What I've seen and heard uh, and talked to an old friend of mine who's in charge of uh, what we call child abuse investigations or child protective investigations. And she tells me a lot of what we probably already heard through other means. And that is because children were not in school and they weren't as visible in the community reports did actually go down. We know that to be the case during the pandemic, but certainly since children have gone back to school, we've seen an uptick in the number of reports, but also an uptick in the number of severe, uh, severe uh, reports or severe injuries and just a, a more uh, pronounced you know, of effects of abuse and neglect, um, whether that was due to job loss or whether that was due to just the increased stress that parents were under. Um, abuse is generally defined as a willful act or a threatened act even that can result or does result in physical, mental, 
or sexual abuse, injury, harm, or it's likely to cause uh, the child's physical, mental, or emotional health to be significantly impaired. So those are common injuries like burns, cuts, sprains, fractures, but they can also include, and Dr. Truman alluded to near drowning. So we refer to those a lot of times as asphyxiation, suffocation, or drowning. Of course, that fits with unsafe sleep or what we used to call SIDS. Now we're more commonly hearing people refer to those as sewage deaths. Um, and neglect, on the other hand, of course, is an omission or a failure to provide a child with supervision, really, or just the necessary uh, minimum to maintain their own physical and mental health, including things like, of course, food, nutrition, clothing, shelter, and I mentioned supervision already. So medical treatment is another one of the things that can be neglected at times. Uh, those are things we we typically refer to when we're talking about the definitions of abuse or neglect. So you've already mentioned some, um, but what are some factors that put children at risk for neglect or abuse? Well, that, that's a, a big, broad category. I think one of the main things that I would say about that is uh, stress. Parents and children who are under stress, like we've, we've all seen a lot more of, lately for sure, um, you know, but also things like um, parents who are struggling with mental illness or who are young or who struggle with alcohol abuse. Uh, and then children who just live in poverty. We've seen an increase in the number of children who live in poverty over the past two or three years. A lot of that could be related to the to the pandemic and the effects of job loss or even a cut in hours. Um, but to take it a little bit further, we also know that uh, children who have uh, you know disabilities um, are often more at risk of abuse or neglect as well. So, what about people who are maybe have some concerns about a child, what are signs that, that, that folks should be looking for? Yeah, those, if we're talking about just physical abuse, of course, then you're talking about the typical uh, bruises, welts, but you can also see cuts, abrasion, redness, bleeding, you know, those uh, bumps or, or bruises that are non-typical, uh, you know, that would be not what you would expect them to be, say bruises on a child's knees or a toddler having bruises from cruising around and bumping into things. Uh, there are a lot less obvious signs too though, like behavior, for example, a child who is normally outgoing might seem more withdrawn. And the opposite could be true as well. A child who is usually very even keeled could be uh, showing changes in behavior. But then you got things like children who just don't show up for school or childcare or who lack proper hygiene or good hygiene or proper clothing or don't have the supplies or steal food or hoard food. Those are some lesser known uh, indicators, if you will. So what can parents do um, to prevent abuse and neglect? Not, you know, not obviously by themselves, but from other adults in their, in their children's lives. What are things that parents should be thinking about in this program? One of the things we, we talk a lot about in April's Child Abuse Prevention Month, that was one of the reasons I was so glad to be here as we're closing out uh, Child Abuse Prevention Month to talk about exactly what it is that can be done to prevent abuse or neglect. And if you're thinking about a parent uh, themselves, you know, one of the things we say is exercise self-care. Take care of yourself. Take breaks. Um, take advantage of your social connections. Those social connections can be school or child care, of course. And I think we've all seen how important child care is and what a role it plays in reducing our stress levels. I know as a parent myself, um, you know, my son's 24. We still need a lot of help. And uh so, you know, that, that's probably going to continue for quite some time. But also, you know, tapping into those social connections and then learning about child development. All children are not going to be potty trained by the time they're two years old. 
So learning about healthy child development. And in the case of neglect, for example, just making sure that you're aware of all the risk and the dangers to children so that you can protect them from potential harm, such as making sure that they're sleeping when they when you put them down to sleep, you're putting them on their back or that they're in the proper child care seat or for, you know, when they're riding in a car, those kind of things. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I imagine being very cognizant of and researching daycare and babysitters and and family members that that are be, that will be spending time with your child is really important as well. Um, I Absolutely. See, I see that Dr. Price has joined us. Um, he's on mute right this moment, but um, for and Dr. Price, we're talking at this uh, point about child abuse and neglect and the increase during COVID um, and what parents can do to prevent abuse and neglect. And I guess from the medical perspective for Dr. Truman and maybe Dr. Price as well, do, do, how do you spot signs of abuse in children? And do you have any advice specifically for parents of, of young children? Yeah, well, certainly to, to uh, I couldn't agree more with uh, Mr. Lolly in terms of his, uh, his recommendations about using social network or using their social connections to get relief for babysitting and stuff. But one caveat is very important is no, you, you have to really know who's taking care of your child and investigate and uh, just don't leave them with a, a neighbor willy nilly uh, or a boyfriend uh, for single moms. Boyfriends, make sure that you are entirely comfortable with them and you've watched them take care of your baby with you present. And if there's any doubts, do not leave that baby alone with the boyfriend. There's evidence based that that uh, single moms leaving their young infants with boyfriends uh, can be that's the highest risk for fatal abuse. Uh, but in terms of what we see that makes us suspicious for abuse physically would be uh, bruises that weren't uh, proportional to their development, meaning a two month old baby does not have the capability of crawling or walking. So for them to suddenly have bruises uh, on their back um, or bruises on their back of their shoulders or their neck or head, that would be unusual. Uh, things like that we get concerned about. Now, the typical toddler bruises on the front of their shins and their knees when they're running around, that's to be expected. But anything that's that doesn't, doesn't jive or things that don't make sense, or you see injuries and the caretaker doesn't have an explanation for it, or the parent doesn't have an explanation for how that injury occurred, that's what sets off alarms and bells for us. Yeah, and Dr. Price, thank you for joining us. And um, on this issue, um, are there, you know, are there things that you spot in um, from the orthopedic uh, perspective, um, signs of abuse of children, and do you have advice for parents? Uh, sure. So I, I fully agree, and I'll build on just like a more uh, musculoskeletal element, what Dr. Truman said, but he's exactly right. Um, one of the, the key things that I notice is when the injury doesn't, or the injury I see doesn't fit an explanation, usually, um, and age is a great one, non-walkers should not be getting they, they really should should be pr largely pristine. Um, there's a lot of certain types of fractures that I will see that are very, that they're like, it's almost impossible to develop this injury any other way. Um, one of which we call corner fractures. They're on a certain type of the, the femur or it could be an arm. And it's usually like a wrenching type of issue. And on x-rays, it doesn't look like a whole lot initially, but down the road, um, it's like a very profuse healing response. Um, it's very difficult to, to cause that for any other way. Rib fractures, posterior rib fractures. It's almost impossible for a kid to develop those if it wasn't for uh, a mechanism of abuse. Um, one of the key things that I hear and see a lot of that doesn't quite make sense is, you know, they'll have a fracture of a, a femur fracture, maybe a walker, maybe just a toddler and they say, I don't know. I think they kicked the wall of the crib or got their foot stuck and pulled it out and broke their leg. It's usually what happens is they have their foot in the leg their, or the foot in the, the crib, they're crying and someone comes in frustrated 
yanks the kid up and like, the, well, the leg's caught or their arm is caught in the, in the crib. And so there's anytime they're like, oh, I think they just kind of kicked something really hard. That doesn't make sense. That's, that's, there's no baby strong enough to do that. Um, genetic issues, like the like bone fragile type of uh, concerns. If there's a known diagnosis, you can rule those things out. Um, but typically like everyone's grandparents have osteopenia and it's, that's, but when they were young, there were healthy bones that doesn't necessarily translate to a kid. Um, there are a couple of injuries that are kind of up in the air, broken finger. Was that, a, an angry parent, um, just kind of torturing the kid or, a, or a parent's boyfriend, um, or did they truly kind of break it, uh, doing something else, um, People get really up in arms in the type of fractures that they get in their femurs, like a, a spiral fracture or something. Oh, it's got to be a type of, but a lot of that's kind of disproves, disproven. So there's certain type of fractures that I see that's like, this is this is clearly non-axial trauma until proven otherwise. I would have to, it might be the only case ever to, to occur without, um, without that that's origin. But the rest of the types of, uh, fractures, they really, in the injuries, they have to follow a good story, appropriate storyline. Yeah. So at the, at the top of the hour, we, we talked to Dr. Truman just generally, not in the abuse and neglect scenario, but generally, um, are there, are there some common injuries that, 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 what, you know, what is the most common injury that you, you're seeing these days? Um, I'll see, uh, upper arm fractures and kids that, uh, don't walk or they're barely crawling. Or femur fractures is the most common, a mid-shaft femur fracture and a non-walker. Um, once in a while, you know, after DCF and other people have gone and, and looked through and thoroughly investigated, maybe a kid accidentally stepped in the, the stroller or the um, uh, the crib or something like that. But uh, those are those are primarily as long bone fractures, the arm or the legs. Yeah. And, I, and again, outside of the abuse and neglect, just generally in your everyday practice, um, are there common injuries that parents that we should be thinking about that are that comp just for every every kid and, and parent um, things that you see more often than not or, or more often than general? that we would worry about abuse yeah. or just yeah. in general just, gen just in general mm. no uh, none more so than than uh, long bone fractures and kids that can't walk any rib fractures um, those would primarily be the case I mean distal radius wrist fractures and the proximal humerus up here, those are two of the most common fractures that kids develop. Yeah. Um, and without like a, and, and typically the kid would be able to tell you how it happened, so. Um, well, I'm gonna, we're gonna move on to, since we have Dr. Price here, I know that um, this is a, just a general question about sports injuries, um, sports injuries, overuse. So there, you know, a lot of us have kids yeah. who play sports um, and sometimes it feels like a catch 22, you, you put them in sports so that they stay healthy, but then they're at risk for injury. Um, we have a lot of parents on the call. How can parents, you know, encourage that, but also keep their kids safe from injury from a young age when they're involved in sports? Uh, the biggest thing is conditioning. Most kids aren't conditioned appropriate for the sport they're playing. I usually break conditioning up into three categories, cardiovascular fitness, and most coaches know that they run the kids until they're almost to the point of throwing up. And they're, you know, that, that one's check. We're good on that strength. I think it's pretty apparent if a kid's not strong enough to play in general, but usually flexibility, flexibility, uh, just being too tight. Most of us don't even know what stretching means. We think, and it's even worse when the kid thinks they are stretching, uh, but it's, it's so insignificant. It's, it's ineffective. So the biggest thing you can do is, um, like people can use a lot of different resources. YouTube is great. You can talk to uh, your physician uh, or your, uh, your family doctor, but in talking about certain types of stretches and stretches are something that doesn't just happen twice a week. They got to do it every day because they're so behind. And so kids are normally sitting in a desk all day, in poor posture, really tight, and they're growing and their bones, they're just growing, 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 growing so fast. And their muscles are just getting tighter and tighter and tighter. So a lot of the overuse injuries are related to uh, growth plate inflammation, uh, various types of tendonitis type of things, um, sometimes stress fractures. But that's the biggest thing is uh, if I could if, if I could just wave a magic wand and all the kids did this, 
I would probably kill half my practice, but you know, that would be okay. Is if they just, if they're flexible enough, if they stretch. Okay. So good, really good advice for parents. And um, since we're not sure how long you're going to be here, I have one more different um, subject matter for Dr. Price, and then we'll get back, we'll get over to safe sleep and some other issues. Um, you, but Dr. Price, you work with a lot of kids, kids that are involved in sports, as we've talked about. As it gets hotter, um, what should parents know about heat exhaustion, um, heat stroke? Um, staying hydrated. If a kid's not sweating, that's a problem. And it's not just start drinking once they're already, once they're already hot. They need to be drinking like all more. If they have a game at noon, they should be drinking tall glass water when they wake up and just really kind of sipping all the way through. The kids should be drinking throughout the throughout the sport. If they ever start to see kind of dazed, they're lethargic, they're and when they're on the field or practice and they just seem like they're not getting it and they're in a stupor or they look like they're being lazy, that's, it may be a good sign they need to go sit down and have a water break. But just staying thoroughly hydrated is the, the best thing that they can do and the body will help take care of itself. Yeah, and Dr. Truman, um, on this topic of heat, uh, you know, we see these tragic stories about a child who's died in a hot car. Um, and we all think, how could anyone ever let that happen? But it does happen. And, you know, Dr. Truman, if you could, um, what are the risk factors that lead to something like this? Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. Terribly tragic uh, when they occur. About 38 babies uh, every year die in the United States. And so it's, it's not a large number, but it's, they're absolutely terrible. And the biggest risk factors seem to be parents uh, in a rush, uh, sometimes out of their normal uh, routine. Maybe that, that certain parent isn't used to taking the child to daycare or dropping them off on that certain day. And it's usually people a little bit distracted and in a rush and they just, uh, unfortunately forget to leave their, their babies in the back seat. And so what we tend to recommend is for some of the things that I've heard and recommended is, uh, anything that belongs with the baby, try to make a habit of putting it in the front seat with you and anything that belongs with you, i.e., uh, a computer, a laptop, a, a briefcase, put in the back with the baby. So when you exit the car, you've got the reminder in the front seat, oh, there's the baby bag. Or when you're leaving the car, walking into work, going, oh, wait, I've, where's my briefcase? And oh, it's in the back seat. Oh, there's the baby. Uh, those are a few of the things. Uh, but just, and some of the motor vehicles that are being built now, some of the, most of the cars are coming out with sensors that will actually alert you as you're exiting the car that there's a, uh, that there's somebody in the back seat or possible movement in the back seat, but uh, that's that's not universal yet, and so you can't depend on that. Yeah. Well. Um, and and Dr. Freeman, you mentioned earlier um, almost drowning or drowning. You know, it, summertime is the time when families are are going by you know to pools and to the beaches, which obviously brings on added risks. Um, what should parents be doing to keep their kids safe around the water? Well, certainly no, well, uh, swim lessons is fantastic, uh, you know, pre prevention, having them being able to swim is key. Uh, being able to get themselves out of a dangerous situation by themselves is vitally important, but still uh, supervision. And that's a lot of times everybody's excited. It's a big party. There's multiple people, both parents, somebody's assuming somebody else is watching the kid. And uh, that can just happen so quickly. And it's uh, unfortunately, I've heard way too many times, hey, where's, where's, the, where's the child? And they're at the bottom of the pool while there's 10 or 15 people in the pool. Uh, all it takes is a minute and, it's, uh, and, that can, and that can, you know, change a baby's outcome or change a child's outcome uh, terribly fast. So are there things that parents should know if the child has been underwater too long? Is there, you know, a, a precautions or, or, or steps that need to be taken immediately? Sure. Cer uh, you know, certainly if the child is found underwater, pulling them out immediately, and unless they are breathing and awake immediately, then I would uh, 
notify 911, initiate 911, and then uh, start to see if they're breathing, you know, basic CPR, see if they're breathing, see if they have a pulse, and go through those things. If they're removed from the water and, they and they're awake and coughing, but then immediately breathing okay and can talk and are appropriate, then they don't need to go to the hospital or to the emergency department. But anything short of awake, alert, breathing comfortably within 30 to 60 seconds after being taken out of the water, they, they need to go be evaluated. So on the preventive side, swim lessons, supervision, so that we don't get to that point for sure. Yeah, supervision, supervision, supervision. And, uh, and most drowns occur not, you know, we're in the state of Florida and all this, we're surrounded by water, but a vast majority occur in families' backyard pools. And so making sure that the back door is locked and uh, not access, the pool isn't accessible either with a, a gate, a fence in between the back of the house and the pool itself, or uh, alarms either on the pool water itself or alarms to all the back doors that access the pool. And certainly a, a good fence around the pool for to prevent other children from, from getting into the pool. So Monica, you've been very patient. Um, again, Monica Tucker is the nurse manager for children's services at TMH and she's our safe sleep ambassador. Um, so there's a, you know, there's a lot of discussion about safe sleep. Um, when we talk about keeping babies safe, we hear a lot about this. What exactly is a safe sleep environment? Hi, thank you, Senator. Um, yeah, a safe sleep environment for your baby means on their back to sleep, always on their back to sleep, on a firm mattress with a fitted sheet, no blankets in the bed, covering them up, no stuffed animals, no baby bumper crib bumpers around them. Um, you can certainly swaddle your baby, but you wanna make sure it's not so tight that they can't move and that the swaddle doesn't cover their face. So you wanna make sure the swaddle blanket comes to their shoulders. Um, the big things to remember is uh, they, can, they should not be co-bedding with you. They should be room sharing, but not co-bed sharing. What that means is have the bassinet next to the bed so that when you are done, if a mom is breastfeeding, for, for instance, when she's done feeding, either mom puts the baby into the bassinet or their significant other or dad puts the baby into the bassinet. The baby does not sleep on mom or sleep in the bed. Um, I know I talk to breastfeeding moms all the time. My daughter's breastfed. I breastfed, you get tired when you're doing that. Baby falls asleep, you fall asleep. Um, but being very cognizant of the fact that that baby could easily roll off your chest, um, could easily get caught up in the blankets. And one thing that parents don't, may not know is that it's not necessarily that something covered their face and prevented them from breathing. A lot of safe sleep or um, SIDS deaths are because there was something that was laid, like a blanket was lightly laying over the baby's nose and mouth. The baby was still breathing, but the problem is they're rebreathing carbon dioxide that they've been ex exhaling. And so they asphyxiate from that. It's not so much something was preventing them from breathing. Um, so that's why we talk a lot about not having soft pillows, not, you know, even at nap time, don't lay them on the sofa to sleep. Um, it needs to be a firm mattress. Um, obviously, once they start rolling over and they're able to do that on their own, that's fine. You still lay them in the crib back to sleep. Um, but if they roll over on their own, that means that they're they're able to move back and um, help prevent their airway from being closed off. And these are um, tips and you all work with new moms, um, I'm assuming in the hospital and, and give this information to, to all new parents. Yes, this is the recommendations by the uh, Academy of uh, pediatrics that we provide for all infants less than a year of age. Um, they should be following these guidelines. Um, some other helpful tips, we teach it to all of our new parents on discharge from the hospital, whether they're being discharged from our family care unit or from our neonatal intensive care unit. Um, we also remind them when we're there leaving the pediatric unit, if the infant's less than a year and is on the pediatric unit, we also give them the reminder about safe sleep. Great. Um, so another issue that parents um, can, are, are obviously concerned about, and one of the toughest issues is car seat safety. Um, we know that motor vehicle injuries are the leading cause of death among kids in the U.S. Um, what are the key things that parents should know about 
car seat safety? How, how, first of all, how can parents know if they've correctly installed their car seats? And Monica will we'll ask you that first. Okay. Um, correctly installing car seats, the best way to do it is usually you can go by your local police station, fire department, and they will check that for you. Um, they also, we have community events throughout the year um, where people can come in and make sure that they have it properly installed in their car. Um, you use the manufacturer directions on the car seat, um, follow those um, and make sure you're using the anchoring um, system in your car. Most of our newer cars have the anchoring system in there. Um, and then as far as car seat safety itself, things to remember is um, every infant should stay in a rear facing car seat as long as possible. Um, I know a lot of recommendations out there say till at least a year old, they should stay in that rear facing car seat until they outweigh it or they're too big for it. And sometimes that's a two, that could be two years old. Um, and then they, they are, then they go into a forward facing car seat. Um, they should stay in that forward facing car seat till they're at least four years old, but again, until they outgrow it. Um, the other thing to remember is the recommendation by the AAP is that all children under 13 whether they're in a booster seat, in the seat belt, whichever, should remain a, a rear seat passenger. They should not be riding in the front seat until they're at least 13. Um, and of course, of the proper height and weight. Yeah, so Dr. Truman, what, what, when is it safe for kids to, you know, we've kind of just talked about that, but is it what the proper height and weight? I know this is something that parents um, go back and forth with their kids on because it's something they really, for some reason, those kids want to get in that front seat before they're supposed to. Um, I, like, it's very, I think that I've never heard that the, the, on the rear facing car seat until they outweigh it. That's an easy thing to remember. What are some easy things for parents to remember as far, and, and arguments back, I guess, for our kids um, to, it, when is it safe for them to, to no longer use the car seat? And when is it safe to sit in the front seat definitively? Yeah, I agree with uh, with with Monica uh, and with those age groups. And what I recommend to reinforce is the rear facing seat uh, until a minimum of a year of age or until they outgrow. They literally outgrow the rear facing seat. At that point, it's it's my recommendation that they go to the front. That's when it's safe to go to the front facing. And then the same with that. You stay in the front facing seat until you're at least four or longer if, until you outgrow it. Uh, but certainly um, uh, eight is the uh, minimum, the, or, yeah, the minimum age uh, that you should be in a car, that you should rely on a regular car seat belt. And you have to make sure that that car seat belt fits, fits right. The lat part of the belt should fit apart, across the top of their thighs, not be up against their abdomen or their stomach. Uh, and the shoulder should go the shoulder belt should go up between their uh, between their ear and the uh, top of the shoulder. Uh, and it's just so many, I've heard, unfortunately, I see the terrible outcomes when car seats are not used or they're used improperly. And so many parents just think, oh, I have a car seat and they use it to carry the baby outside the car and inside the car. And sometimes it's people in a hurry just load the infant in the car seat and just put them in the back and they don't secure it down. And that's, or the car seat is well installed in the car, but the baby is just laid in the car seat and not adequately buckled in. And uh, that, and, and, and motor vehicle crashes uh, usually results in uh, terrible injury or death. Yeah, and I think it, the important thing is, I think I hear you both saying is that it's not, the age, it's really the weight and height of, of the child throughout this that determines seat belt, uh, front seat use, all of that. That That's the key factor, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And one thing to remember too is the getting into the front seat, what the danger is up there, they may fit the seat belt. What the danger up there is that car, uh, that airbag for those children that are sitting in the front seat. Am I right, Dr. Truman? It's the airbag that's the, the most dangerous for them if they're too small. Um, that the force of that airbag coming out and hitting them. Right. Absolutely. Okay, so um, Chris, we 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 talked a lot about the um, on the uh, abuse and neglect, but we didn't really get into sexual abuse, which is a tough subject as well. Um, are there are there signs for um, for sexual abuse that are different from signs of physical abuse, and what should parents know? 
about um, about sexual abuse in general and about the risks. Well, th thank you. I appreciate the chance to comment. I, I before I answer that though, I want to make sure everyone knows that we talked about making sure that you pick a good caregiver. Uh, we offer parent guides and that have two pages worth of how to make sure you're picking a good caregiver in our free parenting guides that are available on our website. The, we talk about the ABCs of safe sleep, alone on your back in a crib, alone on your back, on their back in a crib for every sleep, safe sleep for every sleep. And then on water safety, Dr. Truman's absolutely right. Supervision, supervision, supervision. We talk about designating a water watcher, making sure that you know if you do have a group of people who are by the pool grilling, that one of you is designated as the water watcher to keep an eye on the kids who are in the pool or near the water. And if a child is missing and there's water anywhere in the vicinity, check the water first. Use barriers. More barriers are better than less barriers. And check the water first. I'm sorry, I just had to get all those things in because I know that you know, those are some of the ways we lose more children in Florida under the age of one to unsafe sleep than any other preventable cause. We lose more children to drowning in our state every single year for a preventable cause of death for children under the age of five to drowning. Um, so always check the water first, learn CPR, um, use those barriers, but watch your children anytime they're around or near water. As far as sexual abuse, yeah, it's very difficult to talk about because it's mostly intrafamilial or it's people who are known to the child. So that old saw about uh, stranger danger doesn't really fit, doesn't really apply. Uh, most children are sexually abused by someone they know. Um, so the best advice I think we can give to parents who are with their children, paying attention to their children is pay attention to their behavior. If their behavior changes, if they normally like being around someone and then they don't like being around that person, if they cry or they protest when they're introduced to that person. And then of course, there are physical signs. Uh, there could be you know, bleeding or there could be other signs of abuse. Um, but generally speaking, those are the things that I would I would mention. Thank you. Um, so we have covered a lot of topics um, from the you know, child abuse and neglect to the importance of safe sleeping and water safety. We've talked about sports injuries and heat stroke. We've talked about car safety. Um, there's a lot of information out there for parents. And you mentioned, Chris, your website. I know TMH has another, a lot of information. Uh, is there any other, we're going to open it up to the, um, to the panel, to the attendees, but is there any other topic that our panelists that we haven't touched on or anything that you all would like to add to those that we've spoken about before we go to the questions? Uh, yes, uh, real, real quick, when we were talking about, you know, finding a babysitter or a, a trusted family member or friend to watch your baby. Uh, as uh, as I say, as Dr. Patterson always taught me, dogs bark and babies cry. And babies won't harm themselves from crying. And so understand your level of anger management and that of your other family members that watch the child and take breaks. And if the baby's crying and you feel like you could possibly, you have the, you know, never shake a baby. There's never a good, a, an appropriate time to shake a baby. Just lay the baby down when it's crying and walk out of the room for a couple minutes, take a deep breath. Uh, but just always, always know that there's never a time to shake a baby. No one should ever shake a baby. Yeah, I, I'd like to add to that, Senator, if you don't mind. We have three free tip sheets on uh, safe sleep, what what it looks like, how to, how to go about it, all the things that, that Monica talked about. Um, but we also have one to echo what Dr. Truman is saying again on how to cope with a crying baby. And he's absolutely right. Sometimes it's best just to make sure they're safe, leave the room, take a break. 
there are a lot of different tips, a lot of different ways that people can, you know, make sure that they're doing the best they can to protect their children. And one final thing, if I may, about car seat, about uh, hot cars, I heard the uh, left shoe technique. So people take their left shoe off and put it in the back, Dr. Truman, with the with the baby. So I like what you said as well about anything that belongs to you, put it in the back. Anything belongs to them, put it in the front. I think those are great tips for helping people not forget. And I think it's especially important for people who don't aren't the tip the caregiver. They're not typically yes. the one driving the the child around. That's something yes. like that would be really really critical. Monica, are you going to add something? Yes, I just wanted to add something. When our patients leave Tallahassee Memorial Healthcare, if you've had your baby there, um, if they leave the family care unit or they leave the neonatal intensive care unit, part of their discharge packet is we get send them home with information on shaken baby, um, how to cope with a crying baby, as well as safe sleep. That's part of the package. Car seat safety. Um, all of that is included in their discharge teaching when you are discharged from the hospital. Right. I'd like to add one more thing. Sure. Um, almost any time I get a plug in for these is number one, uh, kids riding on lawnmowers with grandpa. No, do not do it. Lawnmowers on, kids are in the house, locked away. As fun as that may be, high, those 90 degree turn radiuses, the kid rolls off, they go to get up and they slide their foot right on the lawnmower. The rates of lawnmower injuries have not decreased. In, in the past several decades, despite people talking about it. So that's number one. And number two, ATVs. ATVs are straight up kid killers. So if you're gonna have an ATV and a kid's gonna be on there, first of all, they should not be on there. But second of all, you need, I, I think of it as like, they need to be safe enough to say, would you let your kid drive your motorcycle? Because the ATV, they take a hard right, the thing rolls over and crushes them. And so those are, those are two things you'll typically see a lot of in uh, pediatric ICUs all over the country on a regular basis. Good, good, good points. There's no lawnmowers or ATVs. Um, so we, we, do, it, it, we do have a few questions that have been submitted. Um, the first is, I think, every parent's uh, concern and probably um, when, when kids fall and bump their heads, how do you know, what, how do you know when to go to the doctor? Dr. Truman. Sure. Yeah, that, that happens a lot. Um, any the, the times when you should definitely go to the emergency department or contact your physician are as if there's any loss of consciousness. If after a fall, they're passed out, they're unarousable, even if it's just for 10 or 20 seconds. If they're out cold, they need to go be evaluated. Even if they wake up a minute later and seem fine, they should be evaluated. Uh, any time after a fall, uh, vomiting, or they're just not thinking right for the older children, uh, they should be evaluated. But if it's a fall, bunk your head, even if you have a little goose egg on the, on the scalp or something, a little hematoma, as long as they get right up and they're right back at it and they're acting fine, I th then I think that's fine to just continue to observe that child. Uh, obviously, as, you, know, you gotta think of mechanism of injury. If it's their own fall from their own standing height, it's almost impossible for them to, to sustain a life-threatening injury uh, from that. Now, if they fall from a, a height off a ladder or a stairwell or uh, fly off the trampoline or get kicked in the head while they're on a trampoline by another child, those, those type of mechanism of injury uh, involve a lot more force. And so that should be kept in mind. So, and so for younger kids that are just learning to walk and crawl, um, typically if they bump their head or run into the wall, that's that it's the force with, of that of a small, the, the distance is not as far and it's not as concerning as it would be. And if some, you know, something that's outside their own scope, is that what you're saying? Correct. Yeah. And that's, that goes along with those injuries that we see that are outside of their developmental capabilities. You know, a crawling baby who's pulling up, who falls down and bunks their head on the side of a, a coffee table or the floor um, is typically just fine, uh, unless it's pointed and there's obviously, you know, a, a severe amount of trauma. But it's, if they're sustaining the injury on their own as an infant or a toddler, 
then that injury is typically not severe enough to cause any uh, serious harm. Okay, so we got we're, the questions are rolling in. So let me let me start with uh, I see you have one of your uh, maybe a pet that keeps popping up in your lap, Dr. Truman, and this right. question is about recommendations for introducing new babies to family pets or to pets in generally. Oh, yeah, that's a great question. We've had uh, a number of dog bites, uh, uh, but usually when you're introducing, uh, what's the question of introducing a baby into a home with a baby to family pets? Yeah. Yeah, if you're bringing a baby home to a, uh, a home that already has an existing pet, those are more concerning to me typically than introducing a puppy to a home that already has a child, if, if I'm making sense there. But when you bring a baby into a home with an existing pet, cat, dog, it's, uh, I think it's very important to do it very cautiously and absolutely never even if it's funny and cute, let the child around the dog or the cat's food. Uh, that is where we see a vast majority of the dog bites uh, is when the child gets around the dog's food dish and the dog just reacts instinctively uh, to compete for its own food and, and strikes out and bites the child. But in bringing home a pet, I just, you know, cautious, uh, you know, be very, a lot of supervision and, um, and gradually. Um, okay. So this is any, anything to, to a question about allergies. Is there anything to watch for with allergies? I guess anything to the parents should be aware of. Um, I mean, when it comes to, you know, introducing new foods to infants, um, certainly, you know, I think the recommendations are to go, slowly introduce one one new food group as, at a time um, you know and then always be on the lookout for any hives that develop after a new food uh, especially if it's in the nut family peanuts and stuff uh, as a as a responsible for a lot of uh, serious allergies in children and so just being cognizant of uh, it, when introducing a new food just to be on the lookout for wheezing, sudden onset of coughing, wheezing, uh, or uh, hives uh, would be my recommendation. So here's a safe sleep question. Um, it, when is the best time to move on from a sleep sack or a swaddle? And when can babies begin to sleep with blankets or stuffed animals with them, Monica? Um, certainly stuffed animals and blankets and things like that, you wait till they're at least a year old. Um, as far as move on from the swat, the swaddle blankets, you're talking about the zipper swaddle blanket, I'm guessing. Um, again, when they're moving around, when they're flipping from their back to their front and back to their back again, um, the baby's able to move away from that danger and get, get away from the edge of the crib kind of thing where something might be against their face. But for um, most recommendations, we say wait until they're at least a year old before you introduce anything else into the crib. Okay, so this is a, a question. Thank you, Monica. This is a question specific to, um, you know, infants and toddlers. Um, what is the best way to handle cuts and and bruises, scraped up knees for for an infant, for a baby or a toddler? Anybody have an answer for that one? I just put a little neosporin on it and a band aid. Yeah, clean it, warm water and some mild soap. Clean it real good. Make sure there's. If you can make sure there's no foreign bodies, you know, retain glass or splinter, and then uh, yeah, agree a little bit of little antibiotic ointment and keep it keep it open and dry as you can. Okay, so thank you, good good answers. Um, with swimming, we talked about safe swimming, making sure we we've got supervision and and lessons. But th this question is asking about the best way to prevent a toddler from getting too cold when they get out of the water on a windy, windy day. Ooh, um, yeah, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, as soon as they're out of the water, if it's a windy, the younger the child, the more cognizant you have to be, uh, depending on the temperature. But yeah, as soon as they're out of the water and they're going to be out of the water for any more than five minutes, I would dry them off. Drying would be important. And then, uh, you know, putting a, putting a jacket or you know, something on them with a hood, protect their head and keep them warm. And speaking of temperatures, are there certain temperatures you should avoid 
taking a child under or two and under into, I guess maybe thinking about the the groceries, the Costco freezer or something like that. Is, there, is, is, that, is that particularly dangerous? Ooh, um, if it's really cold and uncomfortable for an adult uh, dressed appropriately, the, the dress similarly to the child, then it's it would definitely be too too cold to leave the child in there for more than a few minutes. Uh, you know, that's kind of, uh, you know, there's not a lot of science behind that. Maybe I can, a common sense, I would say. I would just follow follow a uh, common parental sense. If it's too cold for you, uh, then it's definitely too cold for the child. And uh, and certainly the younger they are, um, the more likely it is to just avoid avoid that temperature extreme. And on the on the flip side of that, are there any temperatures that are too hot that you shouldn't take a child into? Well, yeah, certainly. Um, you know, the, again, the younger the child, anything over, anything above 90 degrees outside is when I start worrying about infants and children being outside. Sunscreen, we didn't mention sunscreen, but it's, it's almost summertime and kids are going to be out and swimming. Sunscreen, sunscreen, very important uh, to prevent sunburn. Uh, and then uh, just, you know, make sure they get pl plenty to drink, stay hydrated. And for the older kids that are drinking sports drinks, which are good to replenish electrolytes, I'm kind of a, you know, a one sports drink for every two or three equivalent size waters. And so uh, just not, not going with all juices. Uh, juices are loaded with sugar and it's better for just uh, water. And then after a couple of drinks, or after a couple of bottles of water, then or glasses of water, then uh, a sports drink is good. Another thing to tack on about the sunscreen, don't just put it on at the beginning of your day out. You need to reapply to the child often, especially if you're going to be playing in the water. Well, that was actually the next question. How is there is how often should sunscreen be reapplied? And I have and, and you know, what is the SPF? Is I've heard, you know, over 30 is is overkill, but is that, I mean, is it what what is the safe number that we should be putting in our kids and, and how often do we reapply? Anything over, th I agree, any 30 and above for, for infants and children and uh, every 30 to 60 minutes, depending on the conditions. But I think the recommendations are every 30 minutes if you're playing, if they're playing in the water, which I know it seems Three like- hour for Seems like a I lot. think it's every 30 minutes that they're playing in the water and every hour otherwise. Okay. Yes. And don't even think, don't think that just because it's cloudy outside, that's the other thing. If it's cloudy outside, but it's a warm day and you're going outside, don't just assume that they're not going to get sunburned because the clouds are covering the sun. Make sure you put sunscreen on them. So um, two other questions related, and this might be for Dr. Price. Should kids who play soccer avoid heading the ball, or is there a safe age at which they could do that? Anybody? Got That's a tough one. Yeah. Um, in general, most of the soccer leagues uh, keep kids from headers until they turn about 12 or 13 years old. Uh, what we do know is that, um, and because what we're worried about is, is CTE, uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, um, repetitive hits over and over again. I remember when I was a kid, was, how many times can you bounce the ball in your head? Um, I think the soccer leagues have done a good job of limiting that for the much younger kids. The general rules are head injuries. Kids suffer from head injuries much faster than adults do or uh, near mature children or adolescents. A good age, I'd say once your, once your kid starts looking like more like an adult than they look like a four-year-old, I would start giving them more liberties with that, but unless they're playing in the backyard, usually the soccer it's a it's a, it's a penalty or um, a stoppage of play if it accidentally even hits a kid's head. Okay, that's good um, advice. And then the, the last question that I have here is: any is anyone have opinions on jungle gyms? Children's the, the efficacy of kids on jungle gyms. Uh, that's that's one of those. Uh, uh, I personally was one of my favorite 
things growing up uh, to play on. Uh, um, and so it's, it's one of those things where you got to weigh the risks and the benefits and understand, you know, you try to, you know, instruct the kids on trying to be safe as they can, but you got to let them be kids at the same time. And so, uh, you know, I think just supervising them and when you see them doing things that are a little bit more precarious, like standing upright on the very highest point, uh, that wasn't meant to be stood on, you know, I'd say try to avoid that. But other than that, make sure the jungle gym is on a, uh, on a surface that is, uh, that's not uh, firm. Uh, some people just throw up a jungle gym in the backyard and it can be real hard paying clay. That's, I don't think that's a good idea. Uh, getting the cushion uh, area under the, whether it's, uh, pine bark or something that gives a little i think is uh safer but i'm a i like i like jungle gyms but they do come with risks yeah i agree i'd say the top three traumatic issues i see with kids coming in are the monkey bars um uh trampolines not so much the ones in your backyard but trampoline parks they're uh i think the uh the injury data shows that they're about 10 anywhere from 10 to 100 times more dangerous than they are at uh, your, your simple trampoline in the backyard. And then hoverboards, those are a big one. But as far as monkey bars, that's a tough one. Just know that like, you know, I, I, I agree with Tom, like I loved monkey bars as a kid. I've seen some of these parks where the monkey bars, like I can barely reach them. And you got these kids basically doing death hangs, you know, a full five, six feet off the ground. So, um, you know, those, I would look out for high monkey bars, but. I think rest assured that uh, not many kids die from monkey bars and they break their wrist or elbow and I'm happy to see them when it happens. Okay, well, do, are there anyone have any final thoughts to add? We've certainly covered a lot of ground today. Um, uh, maybe maybe one final thing and that is wherever the, take, take 10, 15 minutes of your day and wherever your child is or spends a lot of their time, just kind of do a safety audit. If it's if you have an infant, make sure you're double checking their crib, and as they get older, you know, the nursery, and then as they get older and they're exploring parts of the house, make sure they're not getting access to under cabinets where there's poisons or uh, uh, toxic powders or you know things that can harm them. And if they're going to be playing in the garage with their friends, take a minute to walk around outside and go, hey, there's you know, make sure there's the gasoline or the uh, you know, toxic chemicals, uh, paints and whatnot that they have access to. Walk around the backyard, giant nails sticking out of the boards, uh, giant splintered boards. Uh, get try to get that fixed or you know get it taken care of. And if they're going to be spending time at friend's house, you know ask some difficult questions. Hey, my kid's going to be over at your house spending the night. You, I mean, you guys got any guns uh, that are unlocked, that aren't locked up? Are you, you know, you kind of, you know, take a little safety audit. And I think, I think that can go a long way. It makes you, you know, it makes you look like a, a dumb, a, an idiot to the, to your kids sometimes. And you might embarrass them, but it's, it's worth, uh, it's worth 10 minutes and, and uh, your kids being embarrassed about you. That's, that's just part of being a parent. Yeah, I think we all, we've all experienced that part. Um, well, thank you so much, Dr. Truman, who's the pediatric critical, critical care doctor at TMH, Dr. Price, who's the orthopedic surgeon at TMH and TOC, Monica Tucker, nurse manager for children's services, and Chris Lolly, who's with Prevent Child Abuse Florida, and their website is Prevent childabusefl.org. He mentioned they um, have some good information there. Thanks to everyone who tuned into this great discussion. Uh, we hope you'll join us for our final virtual baby and family fair webinar, which is tomorrow, Friday, April 29th at noon. Um, our certified nurse midwife, Miriam Gurniak and labor and delivery nurse, Celeste Clark, will be sharing their advice for having the, um, the birth that you want. You can register by visiting tmh.org slash fair. Um, thanks so much, and everyone have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.